Hey, good morning, Virtual Church. It's so good to be with you this Sunday morning. We uh, have a lot going on in the life of the church, and we have a lot more people who are catching Virtual Church as we see these COVID surges happen in our community. So we want to make sure nobody misses out on a single thing. One of the things we want to do this morning is celebrate Vacation Bible School, which we had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we want to thank Autumn Reed for putting together a video of the week for us. And so we're going to show it to you right now. So I hope that was a blessing to you as we celebrate the children in our community. You know, this is one of the highest values that we have as a church is to make sure that our children in our community are loved and that they know the love of Jesus Christ. I want to share with you that the hot dog hamburger outreach that we were going to do on July 4th before we had to cancel that weekend service has been moved to Labor Day weekend. And so we're going to be collecting on August 29th all day here Sunday, when I say all day from about 745 in the morning till right after church about one o'clock. So uh, keep in mind, you want your hamburgers and hot dogs to be frozen. You can swing through the Parsonage parking lot, which is right next door to the church, and just drop your hand hamburgers and hot dogs off uh, before you come uh, to church. Uh, know that we're going to provide uh, finances to House of Hope for them to purchase bonds. So uh, we'd love for you to be a part of that um, outreach for us. Uh, we also want to thank everyone in the church that helped with Backyard Missions. We'll be celebrating them all morning this morning. Uh, we also want to share with you that Georgiana helped furnish the safe house for Life Recaptured, a ministry to those who have been rescued from sex trafficking. I can't even begin to tell you uh, how passionate we are about this ministry and the great work that Chris Rodriguez and her team did in furnishing that house and for us as a church to underwrite it. So uh, just a huge shout out to what's happening in our community and the role Georgiana is playing in this ministry. So as we head to prayer, I want us to be mindful of the fact to, to pray for the Johnson Beardall family. They lost their patriarch this week, Nancy and Jay, lost their father who was uh, known as Pops. Uh, so we want to be in prayer for them as they journey through that grief uh, process. We also want to celebrate that hopefully by the time uh, everyone hears this on Sunday morning, uh, that Joe Rauchy is home and uh, recovering and doing well, and it is truly a miracle of God, uh, his long road to recovery from COVID. And so we're honored to have been a part of that and to see one of our own. So uh, 
so redeemed uh, from this, this horrible, horrible virus. We also want to continue to pray for all those in our church who are still hospitalized and homebound, dealing with long recoveries. We also want to let you know that Julie Kefauver, uh, her memorial service will be this coming Saturday, 814 at 10 a.m. So I know Kemper and the boys would love for you to come and help celebrate her life. Uh, we'll be having it here in the tr uh, Transformational Life Center, this sanctuary. So uh, we hope you'll join us. So with all of that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come to you this morning in the shadow of a virus that continues to ravage our nation and to ravage our community. And so, Father, we do pray protection upon those in our community uh, so that they may not know the consequences of this horrible, horrible virus. Father, we do celebrate those that are recovering. We mourn with those that are still slow uh, in recovery, that are suffering from what's been termed as long haulers syndrome. And, and so, Father, our hearts pour out to them, and we ask in your mercy, Father, that you be with every single family that is dealing with this tragic and horrible set of circumstances that we're all living in and living through. Uh, Father, we pray as a church that we would continue to be at the forefront of loving on those in our community who struggle with this. Father, we give thanks uh, for uh, the Beardall Johnson family, for Pop's life. We pray that you would uh, bless them this week. We pray uh, blessings over the safe house that we got to be a part of. Uh, to help furnish and to be a part of the restoration of women that have been rescued from sex trafficking. Father, this is just another example of evil that is in our world. And you have called us to deliver, to deliver your gospel of good news into the darkest places. And I'm thankful this church is willing to do that. So finally, Father, this morning, before we hear a great word from Jason, I just ask that you would be with our teachers and our students as they return to campuses this week, as they return to school. Father, we pray that some sense of normalcy returns to the world of education, uh, that our children and our parents and our teachers and faculties can feel safe and that can go about the business of pouring into children, to pouring a foundation that they will have for the rest of their lives. So, Father, we submit all of this into your hands and ask for your presence in our lives. To you be the glory in everything. And all of God's children said, Amen. Good morning, church. It's so great to be with you up here again today. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Jason Arnold. I'm the youth pastor here at Georgiana. And let me take this time to thank you this morning for all of your prayers when I was very sick and in the hospital for eight days. My family and I are so grateful, and uh, I'm feeling much better, thankfully. So when I first took this job, I didn't have an NIV Bible. I had several other versions, but I wanted an NIV to teach from. So I asked Pastor Corky if he had one I could borrow until I had time to pick one up. And of course, he did. This was like the first day on the job. Well, I was looking through this Bible on that first afternoon in the office, and a small piece of paper drops out of it. Um, and on it is uh, <coughs> a note um, in Corky's handwriting, and it said, Our youth are not casual guests in our church. They have been loaned to us temporarily for the purposes of loving them and instilling a foundation of values on which their future faith will be built. Well, I brought that note to him, and, and he told me that it was probably from 15 or 20 years ago that I should keep it, and maybe I could use it in a sermon or a lesson someday. Well, that day has come. And I think it's safe to say that his heart hasn't changed on this issue, which is why he still teaches confirmation, not something many lead pastors do. Well, this morning, we're continuing our Command and Control series, and we will start in the book of Matthew. So if you have your Bible with you, please turn to me to Matthew 19, 13, and 14. It says, 
Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So <clears throat> let's unpack these verses a little bit. And it says, the children here who were being presented to Jesus uh, in Matthew 19 were very small. In fact, they were likely infants. Uh, During that time, children, especially infants, were thought very little of. Maybe it was because of the high child mortality rate at the time, uh, and parents or adults didn't want to get too close to the children until they were older. It's hard to know exactly why, but children were viewed as less than adults. They didn't have much value like adults did. Most adults didn't view children as useful or as much of anything until they could at least help with the family farm or business. Children were thought so little of during those times in that region that infanticide and child abandonment were rampant. One of the great missions of Christians for the first few centuries of the church was actually trying to save children who had been abandoned by their parents in the wilderness. Historically, Christians have always been very different in their view and treatment of children. And this love for children comes from Christ and his love for children. The disciples, however, didn't quite understand this view yet. They saw this throng of parents bringing children to Jesus, and they scolded them. The disciples were probably thinking and saying things like, Don't these people know how busy Jesus is? He doesn't have time for these weak, useless children. Can't you see his teaching and healing adults that have significant roles in society? But that's far from what Jesus was thinking. He was actually pretty hot at his disciples for what they said to those parents and children. He rebuked them. But this was no small rebuke. When Mark relays this account in his gospel, he says that Jesus was indignant. He wasn't simply annoyed or just slightly bothered. He was outraged, furious that his disciples, without seeking his approval, came to a conclusion that sought to exclude children from his presence. Why? Well, because children matter to him. He is not too important, too busy, too taxed, or too powerful to make time for children. In fact, it's the opposite. He values and loves children and seeks to bless them. In the Gospel of Mark, he gives us a little bit more detail. He says that Jesus took the little children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. He embraced them with one arm while taking his other hand, laying it on them, praying for them, and blessing them. He takes time from his busy ministry and makes it a priority to bless these children. So the command from Jesus is clear to his his disciples in that moment. It is stated in Matthew 9, 14, when he says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. But he is, but is he not speaking to more than just the disciples? He is speaking to the church. He is speaking to the elders and mentors. He is speaking to grandparents and aunts and uncles. And he is for sure speaking to parents. But are we listening? But one of the major issues today's and in turn tomorrow's church is facing is this new idea that our job as Christian parents is to introduce our children to many different faiths, religions, and beliefs. A kind of trial and error or a what works best for you faith. Let's be clear this morning on what the Bible says about that. If you are a Christ follower, and you have children, there is no gray area on what your responsibility is. Your job is to teach the truth about our Lord and Savior to our children. It is all over in Scripture, Old and New Testament alike. I had to narrow it down to the list, the list down, or else we'd be here all day. Um, So I picked out five verses about God's intended direction for us as parents. I'll go through them quickly, so maybe jot them down so you can look at them later a little bit more closely. First, Proverbs 22.6 says, Start start children off on the way they should go. 
and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, and as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And lastly, Psalm 78, 5 through 7. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Now, don't think I'm naive. <clears throat> I know full well the issues that arise when trying to lead our children. I have worked with teenagers for the last 16 years, and I have three children of my own. You may think that if you impose your faith on your children, you will create a faith in them that is not authentic. You may think that your kids are too young to make major life decisions. You may think it is a waste of time to lead children to Christ because they are just going to reevaluate re those decisions when they get older. And you know what? You very well might be right, but that is not what God commands us to do. God tells us to start children off on the way they should go, to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord, to be shepherds of the flock that is under our care, to impress the commandments on our children, and to tell our children to put their trust in God, and they will not forget his deeds, but will keep his commands. You see, our success as parents should not be measured by the number of our children's souls we win to Christ, but by how well we have obeyed what the Lord has asked us to do, how well we have used our opportunities to share the gospel with our children. Let God handle the winning of the souls. As hard as it is sometimes, our job is to simply obey the creator of the universe. Well, as you guessed, or maybe assumed, working with children and young people is something I am very passionate about. And I would bet most coaches and leaders of young people at all levels feel the same way. There's this incredible quote that I want to share with you. Well, actually, it's, it's more like part of a rant than it is an actual quote. Um, it comes from the head basketball coach at the University of South, Car South Carolina, Frank Martin. And for those of us that are parents in here today, it's definitely an eye-opening perspective from someone that has dealt with young people for many, many years. Let me read it to you. He says, You know what makes me sick to my stomach? When I hear grown people say that kids have changed. Kids haven't changed. Kids don't know anything about anything. We've changed as adults. We demand less of kids. We expect less of kids. We make their lives easier instead of preparing them for what life is truly about. We're the ones that have changed. Ouch. <clears throat> well, after spending my entire adult life so far dealing with young people, I'll admit, I agree with this wholeheartedly. How have kids changed? Do they come into this world with a new set of morals, beliefs, and work ethic than when we were kids? Absolutely not. They still come into this world a blank slate waiting to be taught by someone. And do you know what my generation has done? We have put the responsibility of teaching and raising our children onto others. We have become selfish. We have decisions to make daily that are impacting our children's future. And it seems we are too often making the easy decisions instead of the right decisions. 
<clears throat> do we engage them in the conversations at dinner, even when we were out to dinner? Or do we give them our phones to watch YouTube or play mindless games so we can eat in peace? Do we make them come to the grocery store with us? Or do we let them stay home and play Xbox because it's not worth arguing about? Do we require them to come to church with us on Sunday mornings? Or do we let them sleep in because it's just easier? Do we give them the responsibility of doing chores and yard work? Or do we let them spend endless amounts of time on Instagram and Twitter because they probably won't do a good job with their chores anyway? And let's be honest with each other. The main reason we make the wrong decisions is because we are lazy. I'm not going to sugarcoat it up here, and I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I make the right decisions all the time either. I get it. I'm tired. Oftentimes, I get home from work after, and I've been dealing with kids all day long already. I just want to get home and sit in my comfy chair and do nothing. And that line of thinking overcomes us. And we'd rather hand over an electronic device than spend the time teaching, disciplining, and molding our children, or just spending time with them. And I've said this before from up here, and I'll say it again now. We have to realize that if we truly want what is best for our children, we have to be willing to put in the time to help them get there. We have to realize that it is not about us anymore. When we decided to have children, everything changed. So when Jesus says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, we need to ask ourselves as parents, are we the reason our children aren't growing in their faith? Could we actually be keeping our own children from coming to God? That's not a question that I, that I want to think about, and I doubt any of you want to think about either. But maybe it's time that we do. Now, we've spent the majority of our time so far this morning talking about the importance of us as parents, elders and mentors, uh, leading and molding our children. And of course, we've hit on how important our children are to Jesus. But let's take a few minutes to discuss some of the amazing things our kids are capable of, even at a young age. The older we get, the more we seem to forget what it was like to be a kid. The older we get, the less capable we think children are. But that's simply not true. Kids are capable of so much more than we give them credit for. Throughout history, there have been many examples of children that have accomplished amazing things. And some of the more famous ones I'll go over right now quickly. <clears throat> Anne Frank, whose diary as a 12 to 14 year old has been printed in over 70 languages and still serves today as one of the greatest teaching tools on the Holocaust. Louis Braille, he comp completed his first alphabet system of raised dots for the blind at age 15. Wolfgang Mozart, Mozart, widely considered the greatest composer of all time, wrote his first symphony at age eight. Nadia Comaneci, at the 1976 Summer Olympics in Montreal, at age 14, she scored the first ever perfect 10 in an Olympic gymnastics event and ended up winning five medals, including three gold medals. Shirley Temple began her acting career at age three and between the ages of six and 10 was Hollywood's number one box office draw. And let's not forget David, who killed the giant Goliath as a teenager when everyone else was too afraid to challenge him. Now you've probably heard of all those five before, I'm sure, or six, and <clears throat> I'm gonna introduce you to five more today that you probably haven't heard of um, that are, come from more recent times in the last few years. Jack Indraka. As a high school student, Jack made a major contribution to the health community by inventing a type of sensor that could detect early signs of pancreatic and other forms of cancer. Yash Gupta. Yash was inspired to collect eyeglasses for children in need at 14 years old after breaking his own corrective lenses and having to wait a week for a replacement pair. He read a statistic that 12 million children around the world are living without the glasses they need to see clearly, which prompted him to launch his sight learning organization. This group collects used glasses and delivers them to children who need them. 
they have given out over $1.5 million worth of eyewear in places like Mexico, Honduras, Haiti, and India. <clears throat> Malati and Isabel Widgson. Malati and Isabel Widgson were only 10 and 12, respectively, when they started on a course of activism that has drastically decreased, decreased the global use of single-use plastic. The young women were inspired by the country of Rwanda's ban of plastic bags in 2008 and decided to try to get their native Bali to do the same. Their homegrown initiative of beach cleanups and government petitions graduated to an organization advocating for reduced plastic use in 15 different countries. Bali is officially plastic bag free today and Indonesia will be by the end of 2021 with the Widgeson sisters to thank. Easton LaChapelle, 14 year old Easton, built a prototype for a robotic hand out of Legos and fishing wire in 2011, which earned him third place at the Colorado State Science Fair. And as fate would have it, while there, he met a seven year old girl who had a prosthetic arm that cost $80,000. It was then that Easton's mission became clear to build a more affordable alternative. Now, he runs a startup that uses 3D printing to build prosthetic arms and hands, bringing the price down to just $350 to produce. He has also made the design accessible to download by anyone at no cost. And Nicholas Lowinger. When Nicholas was 12, he met a brother and sister experiencing homelessness. The two would take turns going to school because they shared one pair of shoes. Nicholas gave the boy a pair of basketball sneakers and thus kicked off an organization that would come to be known as Gotta Have Soul, through which footwear has been donated to over 99,000 children in homeless shelters. These are just a handful of examples of kids that have recently made huge impacts on a global level. But there are many, many more kids making impacts in our local communities, on their sports teams, in their classrooms, and in their homes. But when I was first saved, I was coaching at Bethune-Cookman University in Daytona Beach. I had so many questions and so many things I wanted to learn. At that time, I had a few fantastic mentors in my life, um, men of God in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, that were there for me and helped me in my walk with Christ. And I had one unlikely mentor as well. His name was Ryan Durrance, and he was the power hitting first baseman on our team. He grew up in the church and his faith was unmovable. <clears throat> we would talk for hours on end in hotel lobbies, during the visiting team's batting practice, on the plane or on the bus about all things relating to Jesus. He shared his life and what Christ had done and was doing in it. He mentored me. I can remember asking him in a hotel lobby one Friday night on the road after a game. I said, how do you pray? I can't even imagine being a college student and my coach asked me something as big as that. You see, even as a young student, <clears throat> he made an enormous, <clears throat> an enormous difference in my life. He now has two boys of his own and he plays in the band at his church in Jacksonville. And I have no doubt he continues to spread the gospel to everyone he meets, like he did for me when he was a young student athlete at Bethune-Cookman. Well, fast forward three or four years, I had spent the previous four years coaching in college at Bethune-Cookman and then at Georgia State in Atlanta. We decided to put my college coaching um, aspirations aside and moved home to teach and coach at Satellite High School. I was still a baby in my walk with Christ. We didn't even attend church regularly anywhere yet. I had all the cliche excuses that a young father has. It's our only day to sleep in. My kids are so young. They won't like the nursery, blah, blah, blah. Some of the lazy things we have already talked about here this morning. Well, I had just started at Satellite when I started attending their weekly Fellowship of Christian Athletes meetings. Soon after, I was asked to become their sponsor. I accepted and really had no idea what I was saying yes to. Luckily for me, Satellite's FCA group at that time pretty much ran itself, and my job was really just to open up the cafeteria and be the adult present. So every Friday morning, I would do just that. 
my wife would bake something incredible for the kids, and I would bring it in to share. And each week, I was learning more and more from our student leaders. And before I go on, I hope you as a congregation know how much the financial support that our church gives FCA means. It is a difference maker in young lives that are already making a difference. So thank you for that. So one of our student leaders was a young lady named Sky Morrison, a senior on the girls' soccer team. And she led and taught with a love for others that I had rarely seen. Her kindness to everyone she met was nothing short of amazing. Her light for Christ was so bright on campus that you couldn't help but know something was different about her. She made me more confident in my faith. She helped shape my relationship with Christ as a high school student. And our other student leader at the time was a young man named Chris O'Brien. Chris led and taught with a deep knowledge and confidence that 16-year-olds rarely have. I found myself taking notes on my phone when he taught and even feeling lost when he would dive deep into scripture. Chris carried himself as a child of God at all times on campus, and I admired him greatly. In that phase of my life, Chris probably taught me more about God than anyone else, a 16-year-old kid. And Chris is actually the younger brother of our worship pastor, Nick, here at Georgiana. I feel blessed to have had the opportunity to walk alongside the O'Brien family three different times in my life now, as their younger sister, Brooklyn, was later an FCA leader for me at Satellite as well. Well, these are just a few ways and examples that teenagers made a difference in my life, ways that children helped shape this adult's relationships with Jesus Christ. You see, God doesn't have an age requirement when it comes to sharing your faith, when it comes to leading when it comes to being a light for Christ. And it's time we adults fully understand that. It's time we parents start making decisions with that in mind. These kids you see here on Sunday mornings, they're not just learning down the hall. They're not just taking notes while sitting next to their parents in here. They're leading prayer on their sports teams. They're setting Christ-like examples to their peers and adults they meet in the community. They aren't just becoming the church. They are the church. And before we go today, I want to take a quick minute and share with you what I saw from our kids here at Georgiana this summer at camp. I saw kids praying over one another. I saw kids with arms up, worshiping, unashamed. I saw kids comforting and crying with a brother in need. I saw kids leading the entire camp youth band. I saw kids overcoming fears and trying new things. I saw kids packing hundreds of meals for the less fortunate. And I saw 17 and 18-year-olds leading and mentoring 12 and 13-year-olds with love and joy. I saw kids giving their lives to Christ. And I saw kids accepting each other for who they are. Perhaps Perhaps it's time we realize that we can learn a thing or two from our kids. No, we can't stop teaching and leading them. No, they aren't ready for everything life is going to throw at them. But maybe, just maybe, there are some things we can learn from them. And all of God's people said, amen. Hope you have a great week, church.